Hello and welcome back. Um, thanks for finding your way to this room. I'm just going to make sure. Let me just check. Oh, you are awesome. You're almost all here. I think you're all here. So we're ready to begin. Um, so in these times, um, as we've been talking about and hearing so far, it's really hard to talk about the mental health of children and youth and, and us, as a matter of fact, without thinking of the impact of the global pandemic. And not to mention the other um, ho horrendous incidents, natural uh, incidents that have happened since, since and during the pandemic. Our next um, presenter has a unique insight into the impact, certainly, of the pandem pandemic. At the beginning of um, COVID, uh, Dr. Jillian Roberts began tracking a small group of young people to capture their lived experience during that time. Um, lots of uh, foresight and insight, I should say, there. Today, she'll share those findings with us and also some of her thoughts and insights about how, how schools can promote resilience in children and youth, given what she's discovered. Dr. Roberts is a registered psychologist, a research associate professor at the University of Victoria, and award-winning author of children's books as well. You've got to check those out. Again, please just um, add your questions and thoughts into chat while Dr. Roberts is talking and, and I'll bring them up on, on your behalf as soon as we have our chat. So please uh, welcome now, Dr. Jillian Roberts. Hello everyone. I'm just gonna share my screen here and to get into uh, my presentation. Um, just a second here. There we go. Um, I, I first want to tell you all how excited I am to be here and um, to be um, able to share my thoughts with you. Um, I would like to start off with a territorial acknowledgement. I'm speaking to you from my home, which is on the traditional lands of the um, Wasanich peoples. And I come here having been born on the ter 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 territorial lands of the Snanaimo people. Um, but also with my husband, who is um, a member of a citizen of the Métis Nation of BC, as are my children. And so we are here um, as grateful visitors wanting to uphold and honor all of the Indigenous traditions around the world. Um, today, I'm going to be sharing with you some interesting things. So I am both a research professor and I am a clinical psychologist. And so right from the beginning of the pandemic, I've been able to understand what we've been going through through a couple of different lens. Um, and I wanna share with you what we've learned. And I want to also share with you some resilience-based recommendations that I hope will be of help to you as you plan your way in your communities through the pandemic. So I think where I'd like to begin is that it's really important to acknowledge that the pandemic has been hard on all of us, but it has been particularly hard on our young people. In fact, I have young people, uh, little ones that don't even remember a time before the pandemic. They've just sort of come into their own awareness of the world and everybody has been in this, this place of panic and worry. Um, I also have lots of young people whose uh, critical periods of development uh, have been disrupted by the pandemic. So as they were supposed to be doing things in their own developmental journey, those, those um, important developmental um, uh, um, things have been disrupted and their developmental journey has been impacted by that. Uh, first, what I wanna share with you is what we are observing in clinic. Um, so in a clinic, uh, we have two clinics. Um, our clinics see a lot of children and families, and this is what we're observing. Um, we're observing a tremendous amount of isolation and loneliness just at the time when young people are trying to make social connections and develop social competencies. Many children have been isolated and alone. Um, there's been a tremendous amount of health-related anxiety, um, people just incredibly worried about the pandemic, um, catching the virus, their family catching the virus, uh, and what that will mean for them. There's been a sense of languishing and apathy, not knowing when all of this is going to end, not feeling like they have any control over their lives, 
um, and a, a, a sense of gloom and not being able to look to the future with a sense of hope. A, a loss of important milestones, both developmental milestones, like going out for sleepovers or a first date, um, or things like having trained uh, to be a ballerina and miss that stage when they could go um, for that higher level training before their body got gangly or training for different sports competitions or grad or that high school trip that they'd been saving up for. Um, but a great deal of loss, um, as well as loss of important people in their lives. There's been intrafamilial stress, uh, um, families cooped up together, parents trying to do work and homeschool at the same time, um, families, especially in tourism related parts of our province, um, losing businesses, I've had children move in, like the whole family move into grandparents' houses. Um, I had one family where seven generations were all living in one home. What has been a bit of a silver lining throughout all of this, though, is that um, mental health and the importance of mental health has come to the fore. Um, there's a tremendous uh, increase in referrals. I have had to double my clinical team to be able to keep up with the referrals. Uh, and it's really interesting for me how like five years ago, I'd have to sit with a little one and pull it out of them, what was worrying them. Whereas now I have uh, young ones coming in with like a list of things that they wanna talk about, just this understanding that mental health matters. And I've noticed burnout. Uh, doctors, nurses, healthcare workers, counselors, teachers, um, those of us that work in human services, we've really been burning the candle at both ends. I'm not going to read all of these quotes to you. They're, they're just meant to be part of the background here. Um, but these are direct quotes from young people um, that we've worked with. Um, you know, one person telling us that they were sitting in class and too afraid to go use the washroom because they were worried the washroom would be full of the virus. So they sit in class uncomfortable um, or worried that they might have an accident uh, through to um, uh, people feeling in a panic or down a, a deep, deep, dark hole. Um, so very, very poignant um, comments from the young people as they're trying to make sense of what life has been like for, for them and their families. One thing that many, many, many people are saying though is that having someone to talk to, having a mental health person um, available to them right now um, has made a significant difference for them. Um, and that it has allowed them to organize their thinking and their life goals and their planning for themselves uh, in a way that has given them an increased sense of agency. So um, I, was, I was really interested when this pandemic started um, because this isn't the first time I've been in a situation like this. Uh, early on in my career, um, I was at the hospital for sick children and I studied the first wave of children um, that grew to school age um, that had um, been infected with the virus. Uh, that study became my doctoral dissertation. I, I followed that up with a postdoc where I studied the best way of telling children that they were sick or that their parent had HIV. And that idea of how to tell children difficult things has stayed with me my whole career. Um, when I finished um, that re research and came um, here to UVic for um, my tenure track position back in 1999, it was just four years after um, the municipal water was infected with toxoplasmosis and there was um, a cohort of pregnant women infected with toxoplasmosis. Um, and along with a pediatric team here in VHA, I was able to study the neuropsychological outcomes of all of those children infected. So when I saw what was happening around us with the pandemic, um, I mobilized my research team to begin to, to document what we were seeing. Um, and so with the help of funding from UVic, um, and I had a lot of students to choose from, I picked seven, seven students that came from uh, very varied backgrounds, um, all um, sort of late adolescents, I am um, on their way to soon to be transitioning or just having transitioned uh, to post-secondary um, and they were gracious enough to allow us to repeatedly interview them over the uh, eight months, the first eight months of, 
um, of the pandemic. We're still interviewing them, but what I'm sharing with you is the data from the first eight months. What we did then is we analyzed uh, the findings um, for themes and then looked at those themes through a resilience lens. So just a minute to talk about resilience. Um, I know it's a term that we use an awful lot, but you might not know where it came from. Uh, it came uh, in large part from a psychologist by the name of Dr. Emmy Werner, and she did one of the most important psychological studies uh, that we have ever seen. It was one of the longest longitudinal perspective studies. It started uh, in the 1950s. It studied um, individuals from high-risk backgrounds on the island of Kauai um, from birth uh, all the way through to middle age. And uh, Emmy Werner went there initially to measure risk. She was curious, if you could measure risk, what would be worse? Like for example, a mother dying or a father dying in a family. And what she soon realized was that it wasn't risk at all. It was actually the protective factors around the child that really mattered more. So if you have two families where a mother has died, if one family could have a grandparent step in, a church community step in, an older sibling step in, that's what made the difference, not that it was a mom or a dad that died. So coming out of Dr. Werner's work, we understood this concept of resilience and how important that concept was. Um, we got to understand that we could reduce risk factors and we could increase protective factors. Um, and that shaped the way psychology has thought about resilience ever since. Now, after uh, Emmy Werner came Dr. Ann Mastin, um, uh, who's an amazing thought leader in this area. And she came, she is still um, a professor at the Institute of Child Development at the University of Minnesota. And what she learned, she learned two important things. <clears throat> she, <clears throat> she learned that resilience is not a trait. It's not like having blue eyes or brown eyes, um, that you're born with one or the other. Um, it's something uh, that can be developed within each of us. And in fact, it can be taught. Um, and Anne Mastin also did some really important work after Hurricane Katrina. So if you remember, Hurricane Katrina was at the end of August in 2005. And right after Hurricane Katrina, kids were supposed to go back to school. Some kids, uh, um, uh, some school districts decided that, you know, life is too chaotic. Children need to be with their families. They need to heal. Uh, academic gains don't matter um, as much as that family being together. And so whole, whole towns decided to cancel the school year. Other towns though had a different approach and they thought, you know what, um, let's get portables in, let's get out of state teachers, let's get the kids back to school uh, and back to a sense of normality and, and let the parents have some space to rebuild their lives. So Anne Mastin studied both of these different types of approaches post Katrina. And I'm wondering if you in your own mind can, can predict uh, which, which group, which type of approach had the better outcome. Um, the answer is the kids that went back to school. The kids that got back to a sense of normality and all the social connections and their learning not as disrupted, they did significantly better than the children that stayed home. So there's a lot that we can learn from both the work of, of Emmy Werner and Anne Mastin as we plan out the recovery from this pandemic. So what, what we did with our findings is that we looked at them through a protective resilience lens. And we looked for particular protective factors uh, in this group of young people. And there are four that I wanna share with you today. One is the importance of positive relationships. Um, a second is uh, efficacy and sense of control. Third is purpose and ambition. And fourth is sense of normality. So the young people um, talked a great deal about how it was important for them to have access to unconditionally supportive and caring adults. That made a significant difference for them whether it was a parent or a family member or a teacher, having that connection made a huge difference for them. 
And that is similar to the work of Emmy Werner. Um, she also um, noted the importance of an unconditionally supportive adult in a child's life. And it was actually that early work um, that set up the, the, that research base set up the reason why we have boys and girls clubs now uh, and big sisters and little sisters or big sisters and big brothers groups uh, around North America. It was based on that idea that every child needs at least one unconditionally supportive person in their life. Um, this, the students that we, we looked at also had a really hard time with control and efficacy. They had a, a really hard time wrapping their mind around having no control, um, getting to a place of acceptance that they didn't have control and they couldn't predict when this would all be finished. Um, but they also talked about ways that they could try um, and achieve control um, in their lives. And the ways that they did try to do that um, were helpful for them. So some of the ways that those young people um, tried um, to create a sense of control um, is they continued uh, to set goals. They, they continued to flesh out their plans for their life, their better understand their ambitions. Um, and they talked about how important it was to receive guidance from someone through all of that, like the importance of career counselors, school counselors around things like university choice and career choice. Um, I, young people also talked about um, the sense of uh, uh, normality. If they could create and regulate for themselves um, a kind of routine where they were exercising and being careful with their diet and structuring whatever social life that they could, um, that that sense of agency that allowed them to create a sense of normality um, was, was really important to them. And we can see some links here to um, the findings of Mastin and Werner. Werner found that the oldest children in a home tended to do better than the younger children. So older children who would get up and help get um, younger children ready for school um, had better outcomes. And Werner believed it had to do with the sense of agency and self-efficacy uh, that they were developing. Um, and Anne Mastin, now when she creates um, programs like Emotional First Aid Following Disasters, uh, talks about the importance of um, giving people some sense of control, even small control, color of a sleeping bag kind of control, but any kind of control or agency that you can give someone following a disaster um, allows them to become more resilient. And the more routine and normal normality you can have following a disaster um, helps with that as well. So um, what I've done is um, I've, I've tried to synthesize all of this information into 10 takeaways. Um, I'm very conscious that I'm talking to important people, um, important educators um, who can make decisions and can um, influence policy. And so these, these are um, the, uh, my top 10 recommendations for you. So number one, make sure that you're making decisions based on solid evidence. Um, there's lots of good information in our um, extant uh, um, um, knowledge, what's out there. There's a, a lot of great information and in the field and um, go out and see what, what that, the extant literature says. Uh, prioritize the need for human connection. Uh, our young people have been starved. Human connection is important and a powerful protective factor. Promote routine and structure. Um, so if there's like an eighth wave, for example, and everything becomes fuzzy again, uh, the more routine and structure you can maintain in the lives of your students, the better off they will be. Communicate frequently with them with the best information that you have. Um, not having a sense of what's going on and not knowing what's going to happen next is a risk factor. But having some agency um, because you understand what everybody else understands and you've got a good, ac a good access to information flow is a protective factor. As much as you can, ensure that students can exercise a, a sense of agency, choice, decision making. Even if it's perceived choice, it's helpful, um, but allowing children to feel a sense of being in the driver's seat of their own life um, is something that will strengthen their inner core. 
Encourage the development of, of self-regulation skills. Self-regulation is incredibly important, whether it's to learning or emotion or to life planning or to um, diet and exercise. But whenever we can help young people regulate themselves, regulate how much uh, time they spent online rather than enforce it, help them regulate it, that's what's going to be important moving forward. We need to promote and normalize mental health. You know, at the beginning of my career, I was almost nervous to say I was a psychologist where, you know, I was afraid people were going to think I was analyzing them or something. Um, whereas now I think it's much more normal to, um, to go see someone to help you with your emotions. Um, we need more people devoting their lives to mental health. Our communities need to create more capacity um, for human service devoted to mental health. Now, when it comes to ambition, um, one of the key um, protective factors that came out of this study, it is also clear that young people need good guidance at times of transition. That was one of the key um, findings of Emmy Werner's work as well, that young people that had good guidance counseling navigating high school to um, post-secondary or high school to the military or something like that, they did way better than people that didn't have help when the, those train tracks were changing. You know, kids are on a certain track, they just keep on going, that track ends and they're in a bit of a floundry. They need help getting themselves um, understanding which next track and firmly on that next track to keep on going with their life. Uh, and finally, we need to all, all of us, we need to actively work uh, to build resilience within ourselves, within each other, uh, and within our communities. Now, I wanna share with you that I've been working uh, really hard uh, for the past 10 years to build out um, a systems-based way of thinking about resilience to make it easy for educators um, to promote resilience. Um, one of the most wonderful things Anne Mastin ever said um, that resonated with me is that resilience making doesn't have to be grand gestures. Resilience making can be things that happen um, a little bit every day. She calls it everyday magic or ordinary magic. And educators are with children almost every single day. And there are things that we can do in our classrooms um, that promote resilience. I don't have a lot of time to talk about my particular model, but I'll just share with you that I developed this model first, and then I developed the different titles that I've been working on. So I've, I think I've published 15 children's books now. Um, the books are all basically about how to talk about difficult things with children, whether it be death or divorce or, or sexuality, prejudice, um, uh, homelessness, tragedy, um, and then I've developed books on regulation and parent-child attachment. Um, but my books have been based around promoting this resilience compass. Um, my resilience compass for educators um, was published in the Canadian Teachers Magazine in uh, 2019. So these, these are my, my final thoughts uh, to you. Um, I'm just going to read this because I put a lot of time into thinking about what I wanted to say here. But here we go. Uh, with the intersection of my clinical practice and community-based research is a kind of truth. Wisdom emerges from taking the time to study its essential structure. Facets of this wisdom include the inherent desire for and capacity of the human spirit to be resilient. Resilience is not forged through happenstance, in fact, we can accurately predict and thereby foster what promotes our capacity to bounce back from adversity. Let us be guided by the sound principles of social science as we lead the recovery of this pandemic. So there we go. So I, I'm ready for questions. I'm curious what, what, you, um, what you might want to know. And I see that in the chat box, there's probably some questions now. So I'm going to jump in there. Okay. Hi there. I'm here with you too, Jillian, to support you because while you were talking, some comments were coming in. Wonderful. Uh, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, 
just grabbing another question here before I jump in. So talk among yourselves for a sec. <laughs> One of the, um, thank you for that. And that whole thinking about resilience and what does it really mean? And um, some one person just want, I wanted to share this to see if you had any knowledge of this particular book. Shirley said that it made her think of a book called Children of Katrina, mm -hmm. written by fa um, Father Gill and Peek. And mm -hmm. um, out of Katrina, what was learned about resilience? So, so you're familiar with that book as well, eh? Um, actually, I'm not. So, I would I would be really grateful um, if if after if you could just write that name down so that I can go right. look that up. I'd, I'd love I'd love to read it. Anne Maston, so at the University of Minnesota, has done a lot of work around Katrina, um, mm -hmm. and you can go on to her website. She has her CV up on the website, um, and you can actually. Um, see all of the different articles about Katrina that she's written. Great, thank you. One of the things I wanted to ask you, first of all, is were there any surprises for you when you heard from these seven young people? Um, I shouldn't be surprised, um, but I was surprised by how quickly they bounced back. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, you know, one of the things when you work as a psychologist is that we see clinic referred children. And so clinic referred children mean that they've come to us because they've been referred from a school or from a, um, a, a pediatrician. So I, I tend to see children that are, you know, have been waiting for a long time to be seen and are really, really vulnerable. The children that were in this study were not clinic referred. They were just like random sampled children from our community. Um, and I was delighted to see um, how like within a couple of months, how they how they found their groove. Um, and that makes me hopeful that post pandemic, we can help a lot of our our families find their groove. Mm -hmm. What were the things that I think that's probably what your whole talk was about the things that contributed to that bouncing back it does make me curious about um, the fact that some and I, I've asked this of other speakers, you've probably heard today that some young people, some children um, bounce back, uh, um, didn't even have a lot to bounce back from. What's your reflection on that? What's the, what are the differences that make the difference? Is it that one child is more, um, maybe if not resilient, maybe more temperamentally uh, set for, to deal with crisis? What are your thoughts about that? I think for me, it had a lot to do what was existing in that child's life before the pandemic. So if I had children whose parents were going through like a nasty, nasty divorce and one child had to go in lockdown with one parent and couldn't see the other. Um, that was like different than a family that was stable and um, could just hunker down together and play games and go for walks in the forest. Mm -hmm. So what, what was in the child's life, um, I think really made a, a difference. But, but Emmy Werner talked about temperament a lot in her work, um, how having a positive mindset really made a difference in terms of how um, those, the young people in the Kauai longitudinal study could bounce back. Um, and Martin Seligman, you know, he's interesting. He was, he's the learned helplessness guy. You know, he was the guy that started off his career with, you know, dogs and a pen and electric shocks and coined the term learned helpless that we've all used and thought about in our work um, when kids are feeling, you know, like that the work in front of them is too hard and, and they shut down. Martin Seligman now is like a big proponent of positive psychology. Uh, mm -hmm. And he talks a lot about the importance of optimism and instilling optimism and building positive temperaments. Mm -hmm. And of course, the big question is how, how do you do that? Yeah, in a great deal, we do it by modeling mm -hmm. and we, we do it by helping um, regulate. We need to regulate ourselves so we don't raise our voice and flip out and have meltdowns in front of kids. Yeah. Um, and we need when children are are struggling to regulate themselves, they need to be regulated within a loving, an unconditionally loving co regulatory mm -hmm. uh, um, dyad. Mm -hmm. and, and that is a perfect transition to a couple of the other questions that came in. Um, one is taking a look at that list of yours, your resilience compass. I, I, oh, no, no, it was a list of 10 that you would come mm -hmm. up with. And they're looking at the number eight of the top recommendations, self-care among professionals. The question is, should school districts take a more proactive systemic kind of approach to looking at um, impacting the staff rather than, I think, 
relying on the, um, it said, I think the focus of many organizations is shifting well beyond self-care. The onus is on you, take care of yourself, you can do this, to uh, focusing on a systemic um, approach. So it's a system. Um, I, I think probably you're gonna support that because you're resilient. You, but what yeah. the question is, um, the question here is, should they be, but why should they be? And what that might that look like? What are you seeing? Well, I think that would be innovative. And I think that would be leading, you know, the schools that do that would be leading the way and would be, you know, leading by example. And I think that is, I've actually got goosebumps. I think what a, what a wonderful idea. The reason for that, why that's important is that when people are not, um, not well, and they're pushing through and they're tired, then they're cranky, they're not able to self-regulate well, they're losing their temper, they're sh they have short fuses, they're not engaged with kids, they're kind of going through the motions of the day. And all of that is a huge risk factor for our children. So the, the um, we must, there's, I've got two mantras um, I use a lot. One is we must always share our calm, not amplify the chaos of the child, okay? And the other thing is when a child is having a hard time, we must understand that, that they're not meaning to give us a hard time. Mm -hmm. They just really are having a hard time. Mm -hmm. And to be able to have your head able to see those two essential truths mm -hmm. clearly, you need to be well in yourself. And so whatever schools can do to help the people that work frontline be well in themselves is going to have this kind of pay it forward, positive ripple effect for our kids. And then um, what happens, sorry, and then those okay. kids go on to regulate better with their own kids who go mm -hmm. on to regulate better with their own kids, right? Mm -hmm. It's like this beautiful domino effect generationally. Right, right. Um, one of the other questions here is related to one of the important protective factors being culture. And we haven't really talked about that yet today, except kind of um, incidentally. But this is about what we call now cultural sensitivity, about understanding that not every child has the same context. So the question is, um, have you unearthed, did you unearth anything in your research about the importance of connecting to culture? Yes, um, and I, I didn't you know, go there like, in, in, in large part today, but it is very clear that our indigenous children who have close connection to their culture, they do far better than children who don't. Um, and and we, I think we can expand beyond that to people that feel a sense of belonging, um, whether it's a sense of belonging within, um, you know, a, a, a four corners of a borough in a big city, or kids that feel a sense of belonging at church, or a sense of belonging at a cultural center, but that sense of identity and sense of belonging um, is a, a, a powerful protective um, um, factor. Mm -hmm. And I think it goes then towards the, for me, is how beautiful that we live in a country so full of so many varied cultures and how beautiful it would be if we could reach out and embrace and learn about and celebrate the culture of every child that walks into our schools. Mm -hmm. And how that would um, bring the family and the community into the school, at least in spirit, if not, you know, in actually being in the school. And that I think what you're saying is that would that would build resilience. Right. And and the LGBTQ community and mm -hmm. the deaf mm -hmm. community and, you know, various the military kids in their community. Like, let's be open and loving to all of our communities. Mm -hmm. One of the other aspects of resilience, I, I think, and someone's picked up on it in their question is, um, if we think with a deficit lens that the child is broken, one of the risks there is that we become too protective. Mm -hmm. I totally understand being too protective. That's <laughs> where I go to immediately. Mm -hmm. I know it's not healthy. So can you speak to that? The, the, the risk of being overprotective is that you're subtly communicating to the child that you don't think that they're capable of figuring it out on their own, right? Like an overprotective parent is, 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 is communicating, I am afraid that you don't have the skills to be safe in this moment or to figure things out in this moment. And mm -hmm. so I have to do this for you. And the risk there is that you're interfering with the child's ability to foster agency and self-efficacy. 
Um, so it's a fine line, you know, it's a very fine line, um, uh, you know, um, giving children enough protection, um, um, but not so much um, protection um, that you, you deprive them of learning how to protect themselves. Mm. Um, Barbara so, Coloroso, so, sorry, um, Barbara no, no, no. Coloroso talked about snags, right? Think about the big things. Does it really matter if the child has purple hair? You know, not really. Like, you know, you can cut the hair, the hair will grow. Think about protecting kids with things that really matter, will matter five years from now. If something isn't going to matter five, five years from now, let the child explore, let the child develop their own sense of self and identity and agency step in when it really matters. What does that sound like? I'm a student who, or a person who's standing in front of you who's feeling broken, who's feeling afraid. How do you talk to me so that I, I know you support me, but you're not being overly protective, right? Well, Dan Siegel, you know, I, I love Dan Siegel's work. He talks about these four S's, you know. He talks about children needing to be seen you know, not just like one of a hundred in the class, but each individual child needing to be seen um, for that child to feel emotionally safe, for that child to feel secure in their attachment with you, like secure in the fact that you like them, secure mm -hmm. in the fact that you care about them. Um, and then only after they've been seen and are secure and feel safe, would you ever go to a place of, of soothing um, and, you know, telling a child to calm down or telling a child to back up or that doesn't, that doesn't have any real positive effect. Um, even, even if you have to say that to the child, you know, it doesn't have any positive effect until you've done those first three things, you know? Another thing that Dan says that I often hear myself saying is, um, and it's been phrased a little bit differently today, but it's connect before redirect. Mm -hmm. And so even in those moments where there's tension and where there's some behavior, um, that's a reminder to me that everything I want to happen or anything that should happen is more likely to happen in a way that's going to promote resilience if I connect before I redirect. What does that look yeah. like for you? Well, I, I love that. I, I also um, I also prickle a little bit at this idea of um, children being attention seeking. You know, uh, a continuation of that connect before for redirect is, um, you know, if a child seems to be attention seeking, could it really be that they're connection seeking? You know, that they're they're wanting a human connection. They're wanting to engage. Um, they're wanting to be seen. You know, they're wanting to feel secure. They, they're wanting to be liked. They're wanting to be a part of it, to have a sense of belonging. Um, and so to, to, to try to see the world through the eyes of a child, um, not from sort of like a jaded adult perspective, but rather look at what is going on from the eyes of the child. Um, and every child that feels seen and respected, that feels a sense of being cared about, um, every time, if you, if you can't, if you can do nothing else in a day, but leave a child feeling loved res and respected, you know, that, that, that will be a day where you knocked it out of the ballpark. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, while I'm um, looking somewhere else, I am listening to you. I'm just so uh, moved by all the comments um, that people are sharing. Uh, one of the questions is about, um, whether or not, this, this gets to teachers are not therapists. Mm -hmm. um, this gets to the question of whether or not there should be more clinical counselors um, in terms of ratio to support more vulnerable children. Um, uh, and I don't think uh, it's up to you to talk about policy, but just, just your idea about that balance between clinical counseling and the job of the school and the teacher and support workers. Absolutely, like with without question. And I mean, there's lots of different forms of mental health providers. You know, there's psychologists, there's psychiatrists, there's registered clinical counselors, there's um, registered clinical social workers. I, I, I mean, there's child and youth care workers. There's, I mean, there's a lot of different fields. Um, other psychiatric nurses, like there's a lot of fields where we're devoted to mental health. And absolutely, we need three times as many of all of them, all of them. Mm -hmm. And, and that, and that goes to our universities, 
um, to create, to, to ensure that we're programming in a way that creates that capacity for our community. Um, so absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I was wondering about the generalizability of your research, I wasn't couldn't quite couldn't quite get who your who your seven young people were, but I, what age were they, and what more did they have in common? How did you select them? And and then the real question is, can we learn from that just in general about kids right. during a time like this? Right. Well, um, you know, qualitative research isn't isn't designed to be generalizable where um, qualitative research, where it's powerful, is when you have an innovative situation or an, an, a novel phenomena where you know nothing at all. Like if you went out to go create uh, a questionnaire about um, the pandemic, you would be shooting uh, arrows into a barrel. You have no idea what's important and what's not. Mm. What my ultimate goal um, of the study was to um, create something. It is actually created called the RQ20. It's a um, it's a 20 question resilience questionnaire um, that we would be able to administer at the beginning of a school year to kids, see where they um, had strengths and where they had weaknesses um, in terms of things like agency and people in their lives that were un unconditionally supportive. Um, and then we would be able to put into place um, different supports for that child based on what the questionnaire said. Um, and then at the end of the school year, we could readminister that questionnaire to that mm. child and see how we had made progress over time. Mm. So um, the, the study that I did was designed um, to be like a fact-finding mission to give me a foundation of knowledge um, from which I could develop a questionnaire that still, still needs to be validated. Um, but that that was what my hope was um, from from the study. Yeah, you know, it also makes me think about the exciting thing about that kind of qualitative research is that what you're doing is telling us what you heard, and then maybe it's up to us in our communities of support, our our, our learning communities, to try to make meaning of that ourselves too. There's certainly literature that tells us something, but maybe I, I know for certain people who are joining us today have a lot of wisdom. And um, what do you think about that idea, looking at your research, looking at your findings and, and making meaning in, in and amongst themselves and on their own? Well, I, it, it, we are listening to the children, right? Like when we're, when we're documenting um, what children are saying and we're taking the time to consider what they're saying, we're listening to our children. Mm -hmm. We're making sure that they're being heard. Um, and, and maybe we need to do a lot more listening you know, maybe we need to um, take take these ideas, these findings, and do additional research um, to to look for bigger patterns across mm. larger populations. But by listening to the children, we know where to start. We know we know what direction to go. Um, but I think I think that when when something rings true inside of you, like when you're listening to something and it's ringing true. I think you're, you're understanding that there's something there to pay attention to. And throughout this magical experience, repeatedly interviewing these, these just amazing young people, um, there were mo many times when it was like the greatest wisdom coming from the mouths of babes. You know what else I was wondering, just as you were talking, is about therapeutic small t value to the young person of just being asked these questions of just being checked in and and that's not just in the case of the research you're doing there's probably something there in terms of building resilience in young people by asking them what's going on for you what do you think it tells them they're important it tells them that they matter it tells them that uh, it gives them a sense of agency to express themselves uh, being like whenever school boards allow university researchers into their classrooms, it helps with all of that. And I know it can be exhausting, you know, getting all these requests from all these schools to have, you know, researcher A or B come in and study classroom B or C, you know, but when superintendents and schools allow the universities to partner with them, it, it allows um, a tremendous set of good things to flow from it mm, you know it, it, right after we finish speaking today um jillian we are being joined by two young people and it would be interesting to hear their reflections about 
how being involved, having a voice affects their own mental health. So mm -hmm. um, that's the thing. Thank you for raising that. Um, we can't let you go without tapping into the other part of your world, which is all the books you've written. And mm. maybe just a word about how do we talk about the pandemic and other issues like uh, other things that are going on in the world that are big and scary. How do we talk about it? What are your generalizations about how we can talk about these things with young people of different ages? Right. Well, well, thank, thank, thank you. I, I, I think back to my early work, learning how to tell a child that they had HIV and mm -hmm. what that meant, learning how to tell a child um, that their parent was sick or per perhaps their parent gave them HIV. You know, that, that early work around disclosure really has framed how I've thought about sharing difficult things with children. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I've written a great deal about it in both English and French and actually five other, five other languages too, but those were translated. Um, I think we need to have good information available to children. Um, we need to um, answer their questions. We need to promote question asking. We need to answer their questions in a developmentally appropriate way, giving them enough information to understand, but not more than they can. Um, and as they get older and older, ensure that they have access to additional sources of information um, and that they can go off, they can find information and good information and be a good curator of the information that is flowing at them through different forms of social media. Um, but um, but ab ab absolutely, it, it is making sure kids can can access good information so that they can make good decisions and they can tell the difference between good and bad information is going to be one of the key learning outcomes of this century. Mm -hmm. One final quick question. We have one minute left. Um, did you see that the connection to technology, can, people connecting with each other through technology, did that promote resilience? Do you know what? It actually did. You know, and I know we're really afraid to talk about technology use, but I found that technology became the new playground. You know, kids would play a multiplayer game um, with with another child, um, or um, would do like a Zoom kind of birthday party sleepover where it was all these different you know young people in different rooms and beds mm -hmm. painting their toenails, but all by Zoom. Um, but I, I did find that technology. Um, allowed a kind of say, uh, like a, like a lifeline um, to mm -hmm. kids, uh, and and I was really sad for the children whose parents didn't allow them that. Um, uh, during the pandemic, I actually had one child that went away to university um, back eastward that you could go in person. And um, the first thing that young person did was buy technology and couldn't regulate themselves on it because they'd never been allowed to use mm -hmm. it before. So. Yeah, I think we can use technology in a healthy way. And I think we need to learn to regulate our use of technology in a healthy way. Jillian, thank you so much. And thank you for all the work that you do in this area, for all the books that you've created to help us connect with our own children. And especially for really looking closely at the impact of, of the pandemic on, on young people. It's it provided some good guides. Wonderful. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. You're welcome. And on behalf of everybody, thank you. My pleasure. Okay. And I'm going to stick around because as I said just a moment ago, as we were preparing for this event, um, we were, of course, looking for young people who would want to share their experiences as, as change agents, as agents of change for mental health in their schools and community. And it will come as no surprise to you that there are so many, I'm sure 25 young people are at least are coming up into your head right now. Um, and that their interest is in keep, keeping not only themselves safe, but that that um, that compassion, altruistic power, power or agentic desire to do that for others. Um, it's my pleasure now to introduce you to two um, young people who we connected with who want to tell you a little bit about what they've been up to and the impact it's had on others and on themselves. So join me now. I can see Hope uh, Blancombe is here and um, Isaac. Craig, let me just see. There we are. Hi, Hope. Hi, Isaac. Isaac, maybe just unmute yourself and, and Hope too, just so we won't spend many seconds doing, you know, doing that. Welcome. Uh, Have you been watching any of the um, the morning's proceedings? Any of the other speakers? 
Not a lot, no. I you've been, been busy. Class. Yeah, you've been in class. <laughs> well, hopefully you'll get to see them later. Um, thank you so much for joining us and for taking time out of class for this, um, this conversation. One of the things that we have been talking about is how, how we as adults can support young people support your mental health at all times, in particular at this time, those kinds of things. And you're really the experts because you um, are a young person, but also you've been asking yourself that question as well. So before we start hearing about what's, what, what you've discovered, would you tell us just a little bit about yourself? Where do you live? Who are you? What do you want to tell us so that we can situate ourselves in your conversation? Hope, do you want to start? Uh, sure. Hi. Uh, my name is Hope. Uh, I go to Fles, which is in Fraser Lake, and my pronouns are she, they, and I'm happy to be here because it's an advocate for change, and being here kind of puts my foot in the door so that other kids younger than me, the younger generation, can grow up and make change themselves. That kind of, I'll get you say in just a second, Isaac, but I remember Hope, when I asked you, why did you say yes to this opportunity? You know who's in the audience. Why did you say yes? Uh, <laughs> because I do want to provide information for people who need it. Thank you, Hope. Isaac, um, tell us something about yourself and answer that question too. Why did you s decide to take time out of your day to come and speak to us? All right. Um, I'm Isaac. I go to NVSS in Vanderhoof. I'm in grade 10 and my pronouns are he, him. Uh, I wanted to do this because it's a great chance for me to have my voice be heard and like make a pathway for other students and people my age to express our feelings and like what's working, what's not. So I'm just seeing in the chat as we're talking, people are excited that you're here. Just to say that. <laughs> that you're here. Um, all right, so one at a time, maybe before we start, ask, I'll ask some digging questions about what you're doing, but first we need to know what you're doing. Hope, how would you describe um, what initiatives, what are you actually actually doing in your community um, to promote mental health and well-being for young people? And why did you choose that? I would say I chose to do this and how I am doing it is making it known that it is okay to ask for help, that it is okay to reach out to the people around you when you need it. So I saw a nod from Isaac and I need to understand why, why did you think that was something that you needed to emphasize? Do you think in general that's not the case? Young people don't, in your world, don't realize that, that they can reach out for help? Yeah, I really agree with Hope said, because students tend to feel like there's something wrong with them and like that they don't want to see people to see them broken when mm -hmm. they feel like they need help. They're too scared to ask for it. So I feel like we need to normalize the idea of asking for help when you really need it. So, and by the way, that doesn't end when you're a young person, unfortunately. That's a characteristic that many of us carry into old age. So what did you and your community hope, what is the action that you've taken? What is the initiatives that you're involved with? I am involved with student leadership, which is creating events that other students in the school can join and participate in. And I am also in the school's GSA, which is the Gay Straight Alliance. And I help run the board that shows the love is loves. And um, what, what exactly, I understand you do a lot of the work. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So how did you learn how to do that? Why, how, how did you begin doing this work? Uh, I began doing it because as a student who is in the LGBT, I want to uh, show that we are in the school. And a teacher came up to me and said, hey, would you like to join this? And I'm like, absolutely. I would love to. Interesting. So um, you know who's watching this, right? A bunch of educators. And so what you're saying is that you had this desire, but it actually took someone saying, do you want to join us for you to step up? Is that what you're saying? It only took the teacher coming to me because I didn't know that we had one in our school. Wow. So just a little tiny trigger like that got this going. And so now what exactly do you do if I'm a student in your school? What do I experience that's different because of your work? 
um, when you walk into the main hallway, there is a board, a bulletin board that currently says love is love with a whole bunch of hearts and uh, different sexuality, different sexuality flags within the hearts all around the uh, share, <clears throat> love is love. Um, just want to say, if just I just have to do a little technical thing for a moment. Somebody just said it's possible to have Hope's camera on so we can see them and Hope's camera is on for me. So I'm sorry that you don't see Hope, but just so you know that it might be at your end if you're having trouble seeing Hope. And people are saying, can they come and speak at our, at our community too? So you're going to be busy after this. Hope, thanks for describing that, what you're doing. In a minute, I'm going to ask you what the impact of that is. Um, but um, Isaac, can you tell us more about what exactly you chose to do to promote mental health and well-being? And why did you choose that? Uh, well, I'm part of the student voice in the district, and I am also part of the queer alliance in my school, which wasn't a thing for a long time. And being part of those two things, mental health is greatly intertwined with them. Um, because in queer alliance, like queer students are often like overlooked and not, you know, portrayed much in within the school. Mm. And like being part of that and making kids realize that they can be seen and that they matter, it's probably had a, an effect on their mental health, having them like have that exposure. Mm -hmm. um, of course, that's what we wanna hear more about. I'm wondering, um, I know that one of the things that you're doing, Isaac, to, to within the work that you do is to share your, your, your many gifts. And one of them is that you're an artist. and. Do you mind if we share a poster that you did for the um, initiative you're talking about? Yeah, Julia, can you ahead. show us that poster? You can tell us about it while we're looking at it. I said, what uh, was this for and what were you hoping when you created it? Well, I was asked to create a design for the May 17th day last year to promote the day and I wanted to include inclusion with it. So we have the rainbow in the background, which represents the LGBTQ community. And then the trans flag within the hands that are uh, multi-ethnical. Uh, and I just wanted to incorporate a lot of, you know, diversity to it. It's beautiful. And have you, you, have you had, I'm sure you've had reactions uh, to this that people have said it it did exactly what you wanted it to do. It had the impact you wanted it to do. People are saying tears, it's stunning. Wow, it's amazing. It really is. Yeah, I actually didn't think it would be as widely used as it is. And I didn't think it'd be used for this long as well. So I'm really surprised and really grateful that it is being used this much. So are we grateful. Um, Julia, would you mind just taking this slide down now? Um, we're just gonna continue talking. And, and uh, of course, if people, want to see that people are sharing slides, I think. So, so Isaac, we'll see if we can get permission from you to share that as well. Um, so I think I'm getting a sense of what you did. You, you identified a need. Well, first let's talk a bit about that. How did you know that it wasn't just you that was feeling something, but that there was a need in your particular community of, of students for the initiative that you decided on? Hope? Uh, could you repeat the question, please? How did you know that there was a need for doing the work that you're doing? How did you figure that out? Did you talk to other students? Did you just think, well, if I feel that way, other people must feel that way? How did you identify that need? A mix of both. And I forgot to mention that I'm also in student voice. So mm -hmm. the hearing the other people in there saying that mental health is a huge thing um, really made me bring it back to my school and notice it within, other, within the other students. And yeah, there was a lot. Mm -hmm. um, Isaac, how about you? How did you, how did you know? Well, being someone that is part of a minority and always having to deal with that um, constant like feel of unsafeness and insecurity within the school and then speaking to other students and friends and realizing that they felt the same. I realized 
I would rather speak up than stay in the dark and feel this way. So that's an interesting moment because um, I think what we're really curious about is what, what conditions or what relationships or what conversations within a school can happen that would just pick up on that moment when you said to yourself, I don't want to be quiet about this. I want to do something about it. Hope mentioned that one teacher told her about one resource and it made a difference. But on a broader scale, for all the people who are watching, what do you want them to know about what can happen in a school that would help a person get that spark to want to be part of the solution and or pick up on that spark and help you do that? Who wants to start with that? This is advice. Um, Go ahead, Hope. I think something that really made me like personally made me want to stand up and speak out was seeing the amount of harassment and bullying in the hallways towards everybody in general and that so made when me really want to stand up <laughs> so then you had that that you know that feeling in your heart that fire and you got that I want to do something about it um what then um I went to teachers, I went to our principal, and I said, hey, what can I do? What, what things can I join? Where can I take this? And that's when you um, had the one teacher tell you about um, this group, and you also said student voice. Mm -hmm. What was that? Uh, student voice is when a few schools, a few students from each school in the district gets together and talks about what we want to change within the school district. So I think what I'm hearing you say is that adults need to be there ready. There needs to be a space for you to be able to ask those questions like, what can I do? How can I help? Mm -hmm. Isaac, how about you? What advice do you have or what wisdom do you have about how adults or the school system can encourage people like you to be involved? Yeah, I think like opening up the doors to like diversity and inclusivity and having like minorities heard and represented is a great way for students to want to become more involved. Like, cause if they see themselves portrayed, they'll know that it's okay to speak up about their issues. Is that what you've seen? I'd love to hear about what impact the work that you're doing has had. Um, do you want to start, Isaac? I can see you. Um, well, seeing the Queer Alliance get bigger and uh, like more events happening, it's been really nice seeing younger kids get involved and find themselves, right? Mm -hmm. And with Student Voice, um, having seen changes in the school as like soon as after we've had a meeting and talked about this stuff, it's amazing. Like what? Uh, we had bathroom situations for uh, like gendered bathrooms and the schools have already started working on those. And they, we, they also got back to us about um, changing the PE program a little bit because right now up here in our district, it's a little bit outdated. Hmm, just, I'm just thinking about that, um, the, the process that you, you wanted to do something, there was a space within your school, within your context to do something, and you actually had some concrete, some concrete changes are made. Uh, that's really something. That makes a big difference, I bet, Isaac, when the washrooms were changed, for example. Do more young people want to become involved when they see those kinds of concrete changes? I think so. Like the student voice doesn't get a lot of exposure, um, but the Queer Alliance definitely does. And seeing people like come up to me and asking like, when's the next meeting? It's really, it's really nice. It is. Um, Hope, what about you with that question of the impact of your work? What have you seen and what do you think are the ingredients that make those positive outcomes happen? I definitely um, have seen a lot less bullying and harassment within the school and uh, <laughs> more people are joining the GSA, the school's GSA. I have to remind a few of them, but they still end up coming and 
another thing is, is the exposure. I wish there was more exposure, but there's definitely more time for that in the long run. What do you mean? Uh, I, could de uh, I can make announcements. I can put up more posters saying that to these are the days with the meetings and yeah, that it's open to everybody. So how would you make that happen, that more exposure? I would more likely spend time after school or during the, the actual meeting making posters, maybe creating announcements so that the so they can be read off in the morning. Hey, just a thought. I know a person who does really good. <laughs> <laughs> hey, maybe the two of you could connect. Sorry, just lost my ear. Um, do you think that doing this work uh, we're, we're drawing now to the end of this conversation, but I can see by our chat that you're going to be contacted by people to, to, uh, to find out more about what you're doing. Just before we go, do you think that by you doing this work, that it's improved your own mental health and well-being? Okay, I hope you go first because your head is bobbing. <laughs> uh, yes, most definitely. It has positively impacted my mental health to where I can feel confident with being who I am and not being scared of being harassed, not being scared of being bullied and seeing other people come out of their shells. Shells have also encouraged me to come out of mine even more. Thank you. Isaac, how about you? What has it done for you? Yeah, I agree with a lot of the stuff that Hope said, like seeing other people be able to express themselves and come out of them sh their shells has really come back on me in a sort of way. And it's really, really great seeing work that we've put into on the communities come out on younger people. Mm. Well, um, you know, you've only just begun. We're gonna need you for the rest of your life Zuh, <laughs> to keep doing the work that you're doing. And just coming on here and, and sharing your wisdom and your experience with all of the influential people who are on the, the line, that is educators. Uh, is, is do you, I hope you know the ripple effect that you've started today just by sharing um, not only what you're saying, but who you are. What I'm reading in the chat is, um, this is this is authentic youth voice. You're the real deal. So thank you. And um, when we're finished here, you just have to turn your camera off and we're all good, but I can only, I hope we can say, I think we can save this chat and send it to you so you can just see how appreciative everyone is and proud your school districts and proud of you for the work you're doing and and also for just coming and speaking out so thank you so much so thank happy. you thank you you're welcome well my eyes are teary um that that brings us to the end of day one um of the mental health and schools conference i'm just so grateful as i watch the chat continue, uh, how, how engaged you've been today and how much you've shared of yourself, even interesting, even through just this little box with words, I get it. I get that you're there and I, I, I really appreciate it. I'm sure you appreciate it about each other. Um, I hope you're able to use your note catcher and that you can reflect tonight and later today about what happened today and that you were able to hold on to your intention um, today. I look forward to uh, seeing you tomorrow. And, um, and then tomorrow we'll continue to explore the research, the practice, the reality of mental health in schools. Have a, have a, uh, a good evening, stay well, and we'll see you tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. Thank you, everyone. The stream has been disabled. I'm now gonna close this Zoom call. <laughs>